Good evening. Can you believe this is the final night of family Bible school? The last night. I can't believe it. Y'all learned a lot? Yeah. Did you have fun? That's good. That's good. One couple announcements I want to make before we uh, start this evening. Again, I posted the information for Sister Marie Holman's visitation on the wall in the back if you want that information. And again, this is the grandmother of Shannon Young, a uh, member here, and she was a past member, so I just want you to remember that. And also, I've just heard, just found out that Sister Alice Delk has gone back to the hospital. Uh, again, I'm thinking it's Williamson, but uh, they've taken her back over there. So just again, keep her, keep her family, her and her family, in your prayers at this time. If you're visiting, we thank you. We appreciate you. Uh, keep us in your minds, thoughts and prayers. Come back anytime you like. We appreciate having you. Okay. I think that's all I've got so far. So. Are y'all ready to sing?
10, 11, and 12, please go this way. One and two.
Three and four. Three and four. Five and six. Seven, eight, and nine. Well, how are y'all doing this evening? Good to see all of you today, and I thank God so much for um, another day. The Bible class has gone real well. You have um, a lot of children. You've got the, uh, uh, the future of the church here, and you're doing real good with them, and it's good to see brothers and sisters from other places. It's good to have my colleagues here with me who from the House of Representatives and also ministers from around the area, and those just doing good work um, with uh, young people uh, here tonight. So we thank God for all that he allows us to do. Time goes by fast, so that's the extent of my preliminaries. Go, let's go to God in a moment of prayer. Merciful God, we thank you so much for this day, for blessing us to be here and for giving us the opportunity to study your word as we stand before your people the greatest people on earth, we pray that something we say will be edifying as we study your word, but most certainly, Father, glorifying you in this world in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> this is an interesting time for us. It's a time for us as Christians. We have to take on an attitude that we probably haven't had to take on for quite some time, considering what's been happening in the world, in that for a long time, folks actually believed in the Bible. They may have disagreed. And if, if you remember, religion in America has always been our safeguard. We've always been people of faith. In the state of Tennessee, I think there are more Bibles printed in the state of Tennessee 
than anywhere else in the world. So we are a religious people. This has been called the Bible Belt. There are those who are bound and intent on unbuckling, loosening, and actually removing the Bible Belt from this area when we see so many different things that are happening around us right now that are against <coughs> everything that we claim to believe. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> and everything we claim to stand for. There was a time when the stores were closed on Sunday, let alone liquor stores, uh, you know, and we uh, folks decided to let them stay open later on Saturday night, and now you can't buy enough whiskey to get drunk on Sunday. you got to buy drunk whiskey on Sunday. can't buy enough on Saturday to store over. In essence, what is happening is we have those who are trying to change the way we think, and as we see this happening, we as Christians find ourselves in a very unique position because you're in the position to be light, to show the way where others have lost their way, where there are those who have already compromised and already given over. Uh, we are the ones who will stand. I told you the other night, as the Apostle Paul said, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them which are lost. And he also said, what if some do not believe? Shall their unbelief make the word of God of none effect? He said, God forbid, let God be true and every man a lie. In essence, when we see folks telling us that nobody wants to hear what we got to say, that's a lie. When we hear people say nobody wants to hear the Bible preached anymore, that's a lie. When we hear folks say that, well, nobody wants to follow the Christian ways and nobody wants to follow those old morals and those old principles, all of that is a lie. It's all a lie. Remember when Hollywood told you nobody wanted to see Bible movies and Bible stories and Bible TV shows? And when they produced the Bible, it, it just blew the, the top off the charts because they had told us nobody wanted to see it, but everybody seemed to watch it because folks did want to see it. You got to remember something. You're at war. You're at war. Want me to say it again? You're at war. I told you the other night, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8, Peter tells you that war has been declared. It was declared a long time ago. There is a pre-ethnic origin of sin. When we think about the pre-ethnic origin of sin, we're talking about sin before sin was on the earth. Before there was Eden, there was already sin. I, for the sake of time, we're not going to talk about what Jude says. We're not going to, thank you so much, brother. We're not going to talk about Jesus saying that he saw uh, the devil cast out. All I can tell you is this. In the beginning, God created everything. God gave us everything. God hung the sun on nothing. God put the moon in its place to reflect the, the light of the sun. God flung the stars into the sky. Then God came and he made the earth. He tilted it in his hand. He put it just right. He made it rotate just enough so that we have seasons and day and night. He brought order out of chaos uh, within that. You know, there are folks who tell us, oh, this book, and I'll tell you the other night about Genesis chapter 1, verses 1, and what they tell you in physics, Eureka, we have found it. Did I tell you that? But when you think about that, how did that accidentally happen? How did it accidentally happen that everything the scientists say exists is in the first verse of the book of Genesis. They say that when we, we go to the scriptures for those who weren't here, and I want the young people to take this with them, and every now and then open the Bible and see it for yourself. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The scientists, the physicists, I remember when I took physics, they said there are five categories. There is time, there is force, there is action, there is space, there is matter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, that's time. God, that's force. Created, that's action. The heavens, that's space. The earth, that's matter. How did it just accidentally get in the very first verse of the Bible before all of these scientific methodologies were discovered God already told us, all five that the scientists say, Eureka, we have found it. God wants us to understand 
that the wisdom of God or the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the, the wisdom of man has absolutely no standing in the universal uh, uh, implications of things. Why? God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. What do you mean by that? You look at that word thoughts in the Hebrew, it means strategy. God says, the way you look at things is not the way I look at things. The way you figure things out, I don't have to figure things out. Remember when I believe it was Peter that said, God is not slack concerning his promises as men are. That word slack basically means if I'm going to buy a house, if I'm going to do a 30-year mortgage, I've got to sit back and count my pennies and see if I have the wherewithal to pay that note for the next 30 years. You go down here, I passed the Range Rover store on the way in, and you go and say, I want one of those nice vehicles that cost quite a bit of money. you got to count your pennies to decide if you can pay that note. Why? Because that's who you are. God is not slack. God don't have to figure stuff out because God is God. And God said, I told you the other night, if I wanted to know something, I would not ask you. So we got to re remember something. God had war. He expelled the devil from heaven. The pre-ethnic origin of sin, sin began in God's presence, so to speak. But God's presence is always pure. The devil is expelled, kicked out. And as I told you the other night, hell wasn't even made for you. It was made for the devil and his angels. But he's angry. He can't defeat God. So he tries to hurt you, through hurt God through you. And has declared war on you. He went into the garden and told the first and most diabolical lie. And he said, you shall not die. The devil don't have to do a whole lot of talking. All he has to do is twist, pervert, and rest the scripture just enough as the Apostle Paul talked about saying, it's not another gospel, but he perverts the gospel. He changes things to where they don't have the profundity and they can't save you because you're not doing what God told you to do. So what did Peter say? Peter said, be sober. Understand you're at war. You're walking through a minefield. You don't just go walking willy-nilly through a minefield whistling. You're careful. Those who are military people know that if you've been deployed where there are mines everywhere, IUDs everywhere, if they are there, what you're doing is you're being careful. You've got uh, um, all types of mechanisms to try, if possible, to determine where those mines are because men and women come home severely injured because of them. So you don't just walk in any kind of way with no, not being careful, not being cognizant of it. Where you are in the world. Why in the world would we live in a time when we know we're at war, when you know you have an adversary watching everything you do, everything you say, everywhere you go, and you don't take the responsibility to watch your life so that you don't end up in a minefield and you don't end up injured. Peter said, be sober, be sober. Don't get drunk with self-confidence. Don't get drunk with self-righteousness. Don't get drunk telling yourself that you're ahead of the curve, you're smarter than everybody else. None of this stuff is going to bother me. I can do this. I know other people have become addicted. I know other people have fallen. I know other people have ruined their lives, their health, their families, their profession, but not me. That's why Peter said, be sober. Don't get drunk with pride and ignorance, materialism and worldliness. Be sober. Be vigilant. Open your eyes. The devil wants you to walk blind through life. He wants you to tell yourself that you've got it all worked out you got all the answers, all the T's crossed, all the I's dotted. All you got to do is get up and just kind of go on and follow your program every day. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. Don't you know the Lord didn't do a whole lot of talk about the devil? He really didn't. When you go back and look in the Gospels, which are the acts of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we call them the life of Christ. Don't you know the Lord didn't talk a whole lot about the devil? You know what the Lord said about the devil? He said he's a liar. The devil's a liar. When the Lord said the devil is a liar, what else does he have to say? 
when he tells us he never tells the truth, when the scriptures tell us he's the father of lies, when we understand that he is the greatest mass murderer of all times, you can see some of these uh, amateur mass murderers of the last century who killed 50, 60, 100. You can even go back to World War II and talk about those within that regime that may have killed six, seven, eight million. But the devil has killed the entire human race. Every one of us die because of the devil. He's the greatest mass murderer of all times. So all the Lord had to say is, he's a liar. He's a liar. What else you got to say? There was an old song back in the 20s, back in the days when they used to wind up the Victrolas and put those thick records on them. And then it had that fuzzy sound. And there was a guy who was singing through a megaphone that would say, why did you believe me when I told you I love you when you know I've been a liar all my life? So, <laughs> so, and, and this is the same with the devil. Why in the world would we believe the devil when we've been told by everybody that he's a liar? So the devil told that lie. And Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, your opponent, the one that you're fighting in this warfare, is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. You know, I, I, I watched the Discovery Channel back in the old days. Some of the some of those don't you don't have to raise your hand because we're aging ourselves. Back in the old days, there was something that used to come on called Twenty Mule Team Borax, and on Sunday, see somebody laugh. They knew about it, and it would come on on Sunday afternoon, and they would show all of these uh, programs of lions and tigers and bears on oh my in Africa, and and when you, when you see the lion, he's big, he's heavy. He's powerful, but he's lazy. He only wants to make one big move and then go back, eat, and go back lay on the shade tree, under the shade tree on his back. So he's stealth. That lion, you'll see his eyes just above the grass. You know what he's looking for? He's looking for the lazy. He's looking for the one that's unconcerned, the one that's not keeping up with the pack or the herd, the one that's not watching. The one that thinks that they can handle it all by themselves and not keep. He's looking for the injured. He's looking for the halt. He's looking for the easy prey. The lion, he, he has nothing to prove. He's already a lion. He's got nothing to prove. So when he picks out that prey, he's going to get the bead on him so he can make that one big burst. And then he's going to, by the time that animal hears him roar, it's too late. Because when their body stiffens and they look to see, his big paw is turning them around. And as their body is turning around, he's coming back with that other paw to hold them on the ground. Then he grabs them by the throat. And it's all over. And just that fast, it's all over. The Lord says, every one of us have to think and consider the fact that you're being stalked. The Lord knew that the devil brought that foolishness from heaven to earth. He brought it to earth. So what did God do? God deployed somebody from heaven. Since the war started in heaven, he deployed somebody from heaven to come and fight the devil for us. That's what it means when it says, for God so loved. That word so is an adverb of degree. How much did God love us? He so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then the Lord out of his own mouth said, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. I didn't come to show you up and laugh at you and point my finger at you and say, how come you didn't do that better? God didn't send his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. God says, you brought this mess that you started in my presence and I threw you out and you brought this to my children and brought death on my children I'm going to send somebody to undo everything you did that's why Jesus had to come and conquer death for us because the devil brought death upon us Jesus came and conquered it for us so when we think about the fact that we are at war 
War, by its very nature, is adversarial. It is adversarial. So when you have war, propaganda is a regular tool of war. Colin Powell and General Schwarzkopf said during, I believe it was Desert Storm, that they said something that have been said by generals going all the way back to most of our wars, that the first casualty of war is the truth. That's the first casualty of war, the truth. Your enemy is not going to tell you the truth. Your enemy is not going to tell you about his troop movements. Your enemy is not going to tell you that he lost that battle. He's going to say he won it. He's not going to tell you that he has 100 troops. He's going to tell you he's got 10,000. The first casualty of war is the truth. And the devil wants us to believe that he's a whole lot more powerful than he actually is. That's why when Peter gets through telling us about him being a roaring lion, he tells us, as I told you the other night, we don't run from the devil. We put the devil on the run because the scriptures tell us if you resist them, you resist them, you fight. Don't give in, capitulate, compromise, lay down and die. You fight. You fight. And if you resist, he will flee from you. Well, when we, we think about this, brothers and sisters, our job as Christians, we go to the word of God because we've got to find the facts. We've got to face the facts and we've got to follow the facts. And the only place we're going to get the facts, the facts that are going to change our lives, alter our destinies and allow us to think the way we're supposed to think is from the word of God, because everybody else just want to make us enslaved to the things of this world. The Apostle Paul, when he was talking to the brethren in Romans chapter 12, remember I told you this, chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Paul says, I beseech you, I beseech you, I'm begging you, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, present it. Why should God have to chase us and beg us and bribe us and just Hunters and, oh, why don't you try to do right? You know, God says, no, no. Paul says, present your body. Present it as a living sacrifice. God didn't ask you to go burn up some bulls and goats and doves and stuff like that. Build an altar. Go out and chase some livestock. God says, just take the vessel that you own and use it for my service. That's all I'm asking of you. Now, what more can you? Because Paul went on to say in verses 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When I am transformed, I walk away from this big pile of goobity God that folks lay in front of me telling me that this is the stuff I've got to do if I'm going to be somebody, if I'm going to be successful, if I'm going to be able to prosper. All of that is nothing more than that one of the devil's lies, because the devil basically wants you to believe he holds your success in his, in his hands, and he absolutely, positively does not. During World War II, there was an a American-born Japanese woman, English-speaking woman, or several, who went to Japan after the war began. Several, a lot of atrocities, a lot of things that, that are unforgivable happened during the war, but this person actually did go to Japan to help Japan during the war. They called her Tokyo Rose. And Tokyo Rose got on the radio, and she would talk to the GIs, she would talk to American troops, she would give propaganda, falsehoods. She would tell them lies, hoping that they would believe them, demoralize them, that they wouldn't fight as hard as they would. Well, the devil tries to do the same thing to you. If there are some Vietnam-era veterans, there was Hanoi Hannah who tried to do the same thing. And right now, the devil is doing everything he can to make you quit. Why don't you stop claiming that the Bible is the only standard of, mor standard of morality? Why don't you stop espousing that the Hebrew scriptures give an accurate account of man's origin. We know that, that Darwin's account is better. Why don't you stop opposing alternative lifestyles? 
based on the writings of this old Bronze Age book, why don't you stop defending your traditional views of marriage and family and child rearing, all this stuff you teach that is based on the scripture only. Why don't you stop denying your children access to alternative lifestyles, gender expressions, family structures. You keep perpetuating your old-fashioned beliefs. Why don't you back off that stuff and understand that nobody believes it anymore? Lies. All lies. Because when suicide rate is the second highest killer of Americans right now, Americans committing self-murder because they are so demoralized, stressed out, and lost because they don't know which way to go. Lies. All this stuff the devil tries to make us believe. you got to stand and be the light of the world because the devil is flexible and he will continue to try to make you quit. When we go to the scriptures and I look at the prophet, when the prophet Elijah, this, this woman he was fighting whose name was Jezebel, and Jezebel was a formidable opponent. And after Elijah, as we talked last night, and the children did that beautiful skit, she's, man, she's as hot as fish grease. And she wants, she wants, she wants him dead. It's just that simple. She wants him dead. And she comes to him, and I want you to notice what this arrogant woman says in verses 2 of 1 Kings chapter 19. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also if. Look at that if there. She's, she's telling the same God that just brought fire from heaven. Her crazy self knew that her 850 prophets failed, that her entire religion failed, that everything she believed in Fail, and she has no better sense than to challenge that God to kill her. Boy, what a dummy. And that's exactly what she did. Don't you realize when we go to the scripture, even when we go to the Exodus, and we talk about the ten plagues, when we look at the ten plagues where God went into Egypt that held the children of Israel, God's people, in bitter bondage for 400 years, every one of those plagues was tearing down their religious system, every one of them. They worshiped the Nile. God turned it to blood. They worshiped cows, cattle. God dropped them with disease. They worshiped the winged ass, something that looked like a wasp. God brought them and put them all over them. They worshiped cleanliness. They bathed three, four times a day and wrapped themselves in linen. God put boils with pulse and maggots all over them and made them stink. They worshiped the sun. God reached down and turned it off. They, everything they worshiped, God showed and demonstrated that I'm God. I'm God. And brought them out of Egypt, split the Red Sea, and let them walk through on dry ground. Why would you be so crazy? After you have watched a God do this to follow the folks into the Red Sea, I just think, you would have just had to put me, I, I, I'm sorry, you're going to have to put me on report. I'm, I'm going AWL today. I'm not following you in there when I've just seen a God got a pillar of fire back behind me holding me off, and I'm going to go. Well, that's what the devil would do when he intoxicates you to the point of blindness. Remember when the man, God, had given him everything? He's, the Bible says his land brought forth good. And instead of him saying, wow, I have really truly been blessed. God has really been good to me this year. I'm going to let folks glean. I'm going to leave a little bit more in the fields for folks to glean. I'm going to bring a little bit more to God in the temple. I'm going to be a little bit more hospitable to my neighbors. No, he says, you know what I'm going to do? Man, I'm going to tear down these barns. I'm going to build me some new barns. And I'm going to get me a glass of wine and some grapes. And I'm going to lay back and say, soul, lay back at ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. 
God came to him and said, fool, what you call me? Fool. That's what I call you. Thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. And he said, then who shall these things be? Every one of us got to understand the day comes, all of us turn to a yard sale. You know, the day's coming because you can't take it with you. Not any of it. The Lord lets us know it is appointed, doesn't he? It is appointed unto all of us, every one of us. It is appointed unto man once to die and after death the judgment. Why? We are pilgrim. We are sojourners in this world. This is not home. And in case you didn't know, you can't stay. You can't stay. You got to leave. You can't stay. So if you can't stay, you got to get ready to leave. God gives you ample time, ample opportunity. He gives you a good life on this earth. We're not like, uh, you know, sometimes different cultures that had the happy hunting ground, the Egyptians that built the pyramids because they're looking for life after death. I'm a Christian. I'm not looking for life after death. I'm God's child. I'm looking for life before death. I'm a citizen of heaven right now. Right now. This very moment, I am a citizen of heaven. I am a child of God right now. Eternal life is mine right now. Do you understand what I'm saying? We don't wait talking about something wonderful that's going to happen after you die. Get this thing wonderful and right. And get yourself right in the eyes of God before you die. And God will not be tempted and won't play with us. Now, this, this woman Jezebel says, oh, if your God, now you just saw God kill four, 850 of your best folks. They even cut themselves and prayed and, and fallen over on themselves and vomited on themselves and all this stuff laying in the dust. Making an idiot of himself and all Elijah does is say God show him who's really God and God sends the fire and you're taking him on if you go back a little bit over a hundred years ago there was a ship that was christened it was the largest most powerful ship of its day it was called the Titanic now don't take me wrong it's a shame that over 2,000 souls were lost on that night so I'm not making light of it but you got to understand something. They ran an article in the paper before the Titanic went off. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? They said the ship that even God can't sink. God said, oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? God sunk it with a piece of ice, a piece of ice. And man's greatest technical engineering feat of the century goes down because of a piece of ice. Now think about that. Why in the world would we tempt and try God like this woman did? She goes and say, she says, do to me and more also if I uh, uh, make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Did she do it? No. But here's the thing. Our good man Elijah goes running. He's laying under the juniper tree. He's whining. Oh, Lord, you done left me out here, and this old crazy woman's going to kill me. God basically said, man, if you don't get up from there and eat your dinner and stop acting food. I got a whole lot of people who haven't bowed down to this. In other words, God says, what is wrong with you? You just saw what I just did. What makes you think that one crazy woman or one crazy human being is going to come up against me? But how many times do we act like that? We listen to what people say and what people do, and they beat us down to submission because we're not depending on the God who can help us and will always be there for us and says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. In the book of John, chapter 8 and verses 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, 
but shall have the light of life. In essence, the Lord says, if you're following me, if you're with me, nobody is going to hurt you or conquer you because I am with you. Too many of us, we want to do. We want to do. And this is what happens to a lot of us. We want to do before we become. you got to become something before you do something. When you become a Christian, when you become a child of God, when you become a man of valor, when you become a woman of virtue, when you become a child of obedience within your family, when you become one who has studied the word of God and you can do what Paul said, when Paul said, be steadfast, unmovable. 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You've got to become something before you do something. A lot of folks want to preach before they become a preacher. They want to deep before they become a deacon or a servant. We want to shepherd before we open our eyes so we can see what we're supposed to be doing. In essence, do y'all understand what I'm saying? Let's become people of God so we can do the work and the will of, of God. That was a man one time, he had an old mule. And he was tired of that old mule. That old mule wouldn't go straight, wouldn't, wouldn't do right. And that old mule, he had said, I'm going to take your life. So the man got mad. He went out and got a shovel. And he started digging. And all he did. He dug and he dug and he dug. And once he got to a certain point, he pushed the old mule over and the mule sitting there looking up at him out of the hole just chewing. He was just as mad as he could be. He would get a shovel full of dirt and throw it in the hole on the mule's back. The mule would shake his back, stamping on his feet. All evening long, he'd throw the dirt in, the mule would shake it off his back, stamp it on his feet. Shovel after shovel. He throwing it in, mule shake it off his back, stomp it off his feet. Pretty soon when the man laying down all worn out, the mule walked away. Because his efforts to destroy and bury that mule were unsuccessful. Just like the devil wants to destroy and bury you, ruin your influence, ruin your good name, put your light out, remove the savoring of your salt, to where you don't have the influence that God wants you to have. Do you all understand what I'm saying? That's what the devil wants to do to each and every one of us. And just as Jezebel stood there, we got to realize that in this world, that we have got to stand for those things that are true. If we don't stand for those things that are true, then the devil wins. Wherever there is a false leader, there is a false way. If there is a false prophet, there is a false prophecy. If there is a false deity, there is a false destiny. What does God want us to do? Show the difference between the holy and the profane. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and verses 2, But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies and shall deny the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Jezebel stood there and threatened God's man. A little bit later on in 2 Kings, when the man of God came, there were two eunuchs up there. She's painted up her face, and she's standing in the window. He says, throw her down. And they threw Jezebel down. And she had blood on the side of the building as she's probably screaming and falling to the ground. Then they went and had dinner. And he said, go back and get her and bury her. Well, God had already said in chapter 18 and 19 that there would not be anything to bury. When they got back out there, there was her head, there was her hands, and there were her feet. The dogs had eaten her body. I remember my daddy preaching a sermon. He called it meat too dirty for a dog. And I'm saying, meat too dirty for a dog when he announced it. Then he went on and talked about it. He said, her head, she dreamed up the plan to kill that man and take his vineyards within her head. God left that head. 
She wrote the letter that was sent with her hands and carried and delivered them with her feet. When they went to find the remains of Jezebel, all they found was her feet, her hands, and her head. What the devil wants to do for every one of us is put us in a rut. A rut's nothing but a grave with the bottom kicked out. You just fall and fall and fall further until you decide that I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm going to go to heaven. Paul said to all of us, the grace of God that bring it salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What did Jesus say? If I be lifted up, if I be lifted up from the earth, lift me up. Let folks see the difference. Let folks see folks who are following my example. The devil came into the garden. He brought the fight to us. God sent Jesus. Jesus said, I came for two reasons. Number one, to show you the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That word commended means demonstrated. Jesus gave his life for us. But the second reason, to show us what we're capable of becoming. Who knew no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. When Jesus was just a boy, you know what they said about Jesus? For all the young folks in here, the young men in this room to hear. The Bible says he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor of God and man. What do you mean by this? He grew in wisdom. He grew intellectually. Jesus grew intellectually. Don't get intellectually lazy. Don't become people who don't want to learn, don't want to study. Don't become folks who won't read the Bible, who won't let God talk to you. Pray you're talking to God. Study the book. That's God talking to you. He grew in wisdom intellectually. He grew in stature. He took care of himself. Jesus has to take 33 licks that would kill the average man. He's got to carry a 100-pound cross up a, to, a, to the top of a garbage heap. He's got to get nails in his hand and not die before he can say it is finished. God had Jesus grow physically strong. A carpenter didn't do a whole lot with wood in those days. A carpenter did a lot of work with stone. If the women would have stone bowls where they would crush up the corn and the barley and the wheat, those bowls would have to be made. You know what they were made of? Boulders. You know who made those bowls? Carpenters. You know who carried those boulders? Carpenters. God always has system. Everything God does is according to system, is according to order. The Godhead, God the Father, he plans all. God the Son, he executes all. God the Holy Spirit, he brings order out of chaos. Jesus was prepared to take that lick, to take 33 of a whip. I told you last night, that thing would go into his arm and pull out a chunk of flesh. It had iron balls that would beat his flesh to weaken him. The Roman soldiers, under the command of the devil, wanted Jesus to die on the scourging post. Because a dead Jesus on the scourging post is not a perpetuation for your sin. A dead Jesus in an alley where the soldiers have beaten to death, blindfolded him. Who hit you? Who hit you? That Jesus is not a perpetuation of your sins. A dead Jesus who is carrying that piece of the cross on his shoulders, even after Joseph of Aaron, after the, the man took the back of the cross, who falls down in a heart attack and have, with a loss of blood just dies, is not the perpetuation of your sins. 
You've got to have someone physically strong enough to take the beating, to take the slapping, to take the whipping, to carry the cross, to endure the nails, to hang up there long enough to say it's finished. If he can't do it, then we don't have any salvation. God got him ready. Just like God gets you ready. God gets you ready. Every temptation that comes in your life, you already had the power to overcome it. Every sin you committed, you already had the power to say no. Every bad thing you did, you already had the power to resist. We already have it within us. All we've got to do is trust God. That's all we have to do. And too often time, brothers and sisters, we don't do this. He grew in wisdom. He grew in stature. He grew in favor of God. He grew spiritually. Are you growing spiritually? There are a whole lot of folks with prefixes and suffixes on their names. They've got doctor's degrees and all types of academic pursuits, and they don't know God. They can build a building and make it come to life on an empty field that's an architectural wonder, and they don't know God. They can open up your body and operate on organs within your body, keep you alive, and bring you back. you got a brother here at this church who puts people to sleep and wakes them back up again. But you got folks right now who can do all of these things, but they don't know God. you got folks who can take a piece of chalk and do equations that boggle the mind, but they don't know God. And you will never be as strong as you're capable of becoming until you have God on your side, on your side. He grew spiritually, and then he grew in favor of man. He grew socially. He grew socially. Jesus was the type of individual that people knew, and they liked him because of the way he carried himself. In Isaiah chapter 30 and verses 10 The people said to the prophets, this is a rebellious people, Isaiah wrote, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. Notice what Isaiah said, which say to the seers, see not, and unto the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceit. What Jezebel was selling to Israel, what she sold to Ahab with Baal worship, she sold the pleasures of this world. And that's what the devil wants to do to us. you got to fight and you got to stand. When my eldest daughter was in junior high school, we began keeping um, 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 students from around the world, exchange students. Our first exchange student's name was Akimi Yamamoto. Akimi was about so tall, and she had hair almost to the floor, and she was a young girl from Nara, Japan. And Akimi came to our home, and we went to the airport together, and she bowed, and we bowed, and she bowed, and we bowed, and she bowed, and we bowed. When when we all got through bowing, we finally got to the house. She got to the room that we had. We have a big old house. And she looked in the room. She said, for me? We said, yes, for you. Now, when Akimi got here, she studied. She went to Central High School, the same school my daughter was in the ninth grade here. And the difference was Akimi didn't take, she did not take a study hall. She didn't take a break. She took classes every period. She studied hard every period. And she would come home in the evening. She had her life regimented. She would watch television a while, and then she would study. Back in the days when I came home, uh, Brother Bird, I I was telling you about TV. I came home, the TV station signed off. These children don't know nothing about the TV station signing off, the Indian coming on. They they played the Star Spangled Banner, and the TV went black. It was off. Uh, Well, it was in those days. The TV signed off. I was through. I was a TD, a technical director. I signed off my board, closed down everything, and got home. I walked upstairs in my house, and I looked over, and there was a pile of hair laying in the middle of my den floor. 
and I looked at it. It was Akimi. She was in the lotus position. She had fallen over in her book. She had gone to sleep. She had literally fallen out studying. My daughter who made B's and C's and C's and C's and, you know, as smart as she was, I went in and I woke her up. She was in the bed sleep. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. I grabbed her by the shoulder. She's got one eye up. What is it, Daddy? I said, come with me. What is it? I said, come with me. And I'm dragging her, and she's protesting and wiping her eyes and looking at me, and our daddy has lost his mind. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. And I brought her to the den. I said, look at that. She said, it's a kimi. I said, look at it. She said, it's a kimi. I said, look at it real good. She said, it's a kimi. I said, yes. I said, it will have two high school diplomas. It speaks four languages. It already has full ride scholarships at three American universities. I said, it's what you got to compete with. I said, you're not competing with Leroy, Bubba, Cockroach, and Skillet. I said, you are competing with it. That's what you're competing with. And she began to follow her and study the way she did. That child went through school, made great grades, went to law school, passed the bar the first time, but it all went back to a moment when she had to examine herself and do an introspective examination of where she was. We all have to do that. We have to do an introspective examination of where we are. You know, right now, think about it. I'm going to let you think for a second. Where's your nose? Now you can see it. Guess what? It was disappeared, as my grandchild used to say. It was disappeared until just a moment ago. You didn't see your nose. Your nose disappeared because your mind made your nose disappear. But your nose is about the tip of your nose. It's about the only thing you can see with your naked eye. There is something that every person in this room has never seen with your naked eye. You know what that is? Your face. You've never seen your face with your naked eye. All you've ever seen your entire life is a reflection. That's all you've ever seen. You've never seen your, not unless you can pop it out and turn around and look at yourself. But otherwise, all you've seen your whole life is a reflection of yourself. That's the only reason why you personally, I know what you look like. You know what I look like. But without a mirror or some water or something, I would not know what I look like. Brothers and sisters, here it is. That's the mirror. And what God wants you to do is look in it and be for real with what you see. What is your life retrospectively? Where are you coming from? Where did God find you? Where were you when you had that moment when you said, like the prodigal said, when he finds himself down in a pig pen about to fill his belly with the husk. Jews didn't eat pig, and these pigs are used for garbage disposal. Can you imagine how stinky this was? And he's putting this stuff up to his nose. Coach, I believe it was kind of like the ammonia camp that used to break when I get knocked out trying to tackle somebody. And they put that ammonia in and wake you up. I believe that stuff woke him up. And he looked at himself and said, what in the world am I doing? What in the world am I doing? He said, in my father's house, that's food. I, my daddy's employees eat better than this. What am I doing? So let me arise and go to my father's house. And this boy probably used his last strength. And he, his daddy, is looking he represents God looking, waiting, looking, waiting, but he's not going to come chase you. And he saw his son, and he came out, saw his son coming back to him. When he say he fell down on his son, it's because he probably didn't have the strength to stand up. And he fell down on him. And he says, somebody, bring a coat. I don't want my child's nakedness to be shown. God don't want you to be naked before the world. Put a ring on my child's finger. I want folks to know he belongs to somebody. God wants you to know he, you belong to somebody. When you look back in your life retrospectively, I bet you a dollar against a bullfrog, 
you can find that moment in your life when you said, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this. I'm stopping this. I'm walking away from this. Enough of this. I'm starting over. Can't you? If you look retrospectively, if you are a child of God today, you know that was that moment when God had to wake you up like the prodigal. Nathan had to go before David and give him the allegory and say there was two, there were two men, yes. One of those men was rich. Uh-huh. One man had a lot of sheep. You okay? One man had one sheep. Okay. He said the man that had a lot of sheep went and took the other man's little ewe lamb. What? And he got him and cooked him and barbecued him and served him to his friend. He did what? He served him to his guest. Boy, David is a good man with a good heart. He got upset. You go get him. You bring him to me and I'll kill him myself. David said, you're the man. You're the man. You're the man, David. You're the man, David. You're the man. You're the man. David's walking around like he hasn't done anything. He's taken a man's life, destroyed his house, done evil in the sight of God, and he's walking around like nothing happened. Why? Because the devil will anesthetize you. Paul said your conscience seared with a hot iron. He'll fix it so that stuff don't bother you. We got children right now, children right now, children who can turn a gun to the side, shoot you between your eyes, and sit on your body and eat a cheeseburger. Why? Conscious seared. When you remove the conscious, you got a beast. And we need to learn this. That's why God says train them up in the nurture and admonition of God. Why? Give them a conscious, an inner man, something that says don't do that. Don't believe that. Don't become part of that. David had to say the same thing the prodigal said, as I told you the other night. Both of them said the same exact thing when the reality of where they had fallen came to them. I have sinned against God. Against God. Prodigal didn't say, I've sinned against you, Daddy. I sinned against my brother. David didn't say, I've sinned against Bathsheba. I've sinned against Uriah. Both of them said, I've sinned against God. Because every sin is against God. Sin is a transgression of God's law, God's will. I have sinned against God. And God takes it personal because he's been too good to us. But he forgave David and the father forgave the prodigal because God is saying, I would rather take you back whatever you've done, whatever condition, I'd rather bring you and cleanse you and watch you and strengthen you and start you over than to let my enemy have your soul. I am not willing to give up on you. God is a God of a second chance. And he will give it to us, but we got to take advantage of it. So what is your life retrospectively? When you look back in your life, you ought to see yourself coming to God now, what is your life introspectively? Where are you today? What are you saying right now? If God should take you right now, the other day, sad thing happened. Sad thing happened the other day. We were talking about it. We had a colleague. They opened the door. He was sitting at his desk. He had had some type of attack, aneurysm, heart attack, something. But he was sitting at his desk, and he expired just like that. He didn't go to work that day saying, well, I know I'm going to die today, so let me get myself dressed and let me sit down at the desk because I'm going to die today. Who does that? Nobody. Nobody. Where do you stand right now? If you don't wake up tomorrow, where do you stand right now? Remember when we used to pray like children? We had these beautiful children up here singing. When we used to close our eyes and say, Lord, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. Remember when we used to pray those sincere prayers? And then we pray for mama, daddy, grandpa, mama, the dog, the cat, the bird, everybody else. And remember how good you used to feel when you crawled in the bed and pulled the covers up and turned the light? You felt safe. 
Why don't we feel like that anymore? How do we get so old and crusty and distanced from God to where we can't sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells you. The children were singing, I have joy, joy, joy down in my heart. What happens to us that we lose the joy of just being a child of God? Just a child. Where are you staying right now? Paul said, examine yourself. They say, if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he fools himself. Where do you stand right now? Where is your life prospectively? We know where you've been introspectively. Where do you stand interest, uh, retrospectively, introspectively? Where are you prospectively? Where are you going? If you stay on the course you're on right now, where will you end up? Where will you be? What's the conclusion of it? We all have to ask ourselves that from time to time, where in the world am I going? You know what God's trying to do? When God puts this book in front of you, for many of us, he's trying to put us in the gap. You know what the gap is? The gap is where you find yourself when you stand between what you cannot deny and what you do not want to accept. And that's where a lot of us find ourselves. We can't deny it's right, it's true. We know God will make us better and lead us better, but we're just not ready to accept it. Too many of us in the church are what somebody said, I've read one time, are convinced but not converted. Oh, yeah, we're convinced. Stop telling me, okay, okay, I take it. Baptism is essential to salvation. Don't quote Acts 2.38 to me anymore. Don't quote Matthew 16, 18, Mark 15, 16. No, I'm tired of those scriptures. Okay, I accept it. Baptism is essential to salvation. Okay, don't tell me of the commune every Sunday anymore. I know every Sunday has a first day. Okay, we commune on the first day. I got it. Don't talk to me about titles. Don't talk to me about music. I got it. Where's the water? Let's go jumping. How many folks have been convinced that it's right, but they haven't been converted to be right. I said the other night, we talk about getting to Christ, but Christ can't get in us. We substitute church going for Christianity. We got to be Christians. The Lord wants us to change. You know why? Because the Lord wants you to come to heaven. He wants you to come to heaven. We got it right now. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verses 5, we've got the Jezebels of the world, and I know I'm probably going to catch flack for saying this, but right now we have the murder of the innocents in America. The murder of the innocents. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 1, 5, before I formed thee, God said, in the womb I knew thee. What we have right now is a nation that has stepped back from its principles, and between now and Going back to 1973, we have taken the lives of over 53 million unborn children. 53 million. I want that number to rattle around. 53 million unborn babies have been killed and thrown away like garbage. Thrown in plastic bags and just thrown away. And God says that they are my heritage. But the devil wants us to forget about those things that are from God. When we go back and we study about Cain, and the Bible says that Cain, God came to Cain and said, where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Where is your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? God said, I know what you did. Because your brother's blood cried out to me. I'm John D. Berry, Jr. I was born 1951, John Gaston Hospital. Memphis, Tennessee, to John J. Deberry Sr. and Pearl Deberry. I am their blood. I stand before you, even though my mama's been dead since 1970. My dad has been dead almost 13 years. My grandparents, my great grandparents, all who were members of the church have been gone, but I'm their blood. I stand right here before you. When a child is killed, massacred, murdered, thrown away, you didn't just kill that child. 
you kill that child's whole line. When God said that child's blood, that Abel's blood cried out, those are his unborn children who are crying out, we won't be born because Cain killed us. Every one of those babies, you kill that whole line of, oh, we probably killed the person that could cure cancer or Alzheimer's or all types of diseases. We don't know who we killed and threw away. When we hear the word of God, God will make us open our eyes to where we stand. He will make us open eyes. When we believe the word of God, Paul said in Romans 10 and 17, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Where there is no word of God, it's like not being able to see your face. You will not have the truth. All of us have had a picture, and we looked at the picture and say, that's not me. That's not me, but it is you. It's from a perspective you don't care for. But you got to admit, that's me. When I walked out of my apartment almost to, to leave this afternoon, I had already fixed my tire running because I'm trying to get, I was going to go eat with my brother and sister Bud. So, hey, food excites me. And so I'm getting ready real quick. And, and I, I'm turning the lights off and I look in the, and I'm thinking I got everything right. And I'm looking in the mirror. The mirror say, the tire crooked. I can say, boy, I'm looking good. The mirror say, the tire crooked. Boy, I'm looking good. The mirror say, fool, your tire crooked. I got to straighten my tie because the mirror told me my tie is crooked. Bible say your life's crooked, your thinking crooked, your actions are crooked, your worship is crooked, your faith is crooked. Get it straight now. We can argue or we can repent and acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God and be buried in the water of the grave of baptism. I don't have gills, you don't either. You can't breathe on the water. For that moment that you stand in the water, and they said that one of the young men was baptized, I believe, last week. For that moment, they tell you to hold your breath, and the brother will take and carry you under that water in that watery grave. Guess what? While you're under that water, you simulate the Lord's death because you can't breathe. For that moment, you are the same as dead because you are not breathing. And then you come out of that water, and you take your first breath. As a reborn child of God, to walk in the newness of life. And that's what the Lord wants to get. That's a good deal. He says, every bad word is though you never said it. Every bad deed is though you never did it. Every bad thought is though you never thought it. Every bad action is though it never happened. I wipe the slate clean. And I give you a brand new birthday. Every one of us need that. We want that. You've got to have that because the Lord's coming back and you want to go back with him. You want to go back with him. A woman you want to go back. Make sure that your life is what God wants it to be. Don't you have to hurt me for me? Get out of my face. You are a worker of iniquity. Get out of my face. Because I never knew you. We were never close. Don't do that. This is a wonderful church. You are wonderful people. Let's meet in heaven and sing and shout to the Lord. While we sing.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Our most holy and all righteous Father in heaven, we can truly say that it's been good to be here today. We're so blessed to have your word taught to us so clearly in such a way that we can understand truly what you tell us. We're thankful that you've allowed us this week to have this family Bible school here, Father. We're, we're grateful for all the ones who have participated, who have been a part of it. We're mindful, Father, of this world. That there are so many in it that need your word your word to be taught to them. May we as your children, as, as Christians go, as you've commanded, that we live our lives to be that light that shines, that all can see it, and that we can glorify you in all things. Again, fathers, we leave this place tonight. Please be with us. Again, guide us, direct us, as you have promised. And again, we're most thankful for that sacrifice, that gift of your Son, who died upon that cruel cross for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Okay, guys, are you ready for another story tonight? Yeah. Good. This is the last night. But it's a, but it's a good, it is sad. But it's a good story, okay? All right, let's see. Who are we talking about tonight? Elijah. Elijah. And I guess we'll start the story. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. The people in Israel had been shown who was the true God. Baal had not sent fire, and Baal had not sent rain. And the Lord showed them that he was the only one that could bring fire and rain. And after the big challenge on Mount Carmel and the, rain, and the rainstorm, Ahab and Elijah started for Jezreel. Now remember, King Ahab, when he got around town, he got in his chariot and his horses, and they would drive him around. But Elijah only had feet like me and you, and we just walked, he just walked around. So as the man left Carmel, we're going to wait for, there they are. Okay. So you've got Elijah. Oh, and there's the king. Okay. And there's the guard. Okay. And as the men left Carmel up on the mountaintop, King Ahab went out first on his chariot. Mm-hmm. But the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he tucked up his coat, and he ran toward Jezreel. And because the Lord was with Elijah, he ran faster than the chariot that pulled the horses. Well, when Ahab ran back at the palace, to the palace in Jezreel, his wife Jezebel was waiting for him. Baal didn't answer, but Elijah's God answered. Now the people are worshiping the Lord God, and Elijah has killed the prophets of Baal. You go and tell that to Elijah that I say, may the gods kill me. He is not dead by the time. Jezebel sends you this message. May the gods kill me. You are not dead by tomorrow. This made Elijah very afraid and he ran for his life. He was so scared by Jezebel's threat, he traveled 100 miles away 
out of Israel and into the kingdom of Judah. Elijah sat under a tree in the wilderness and prayed. Oh, Lord God, I, I can't do this anymore. Please just take my life. And then Elijah lay down under the tree and went to sleep. And while he was sleeping, an angel came. And when Elijah looked, there was a hot piece of bread and a jug of water. Elijah ate and drank and laid back down. Then the angel came again. Arise and eat. The journey is too great for you. Elijah got up, ate and drank. And then began his journey to Mount Horeb. He came to a cave and spent the night. And the next day, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? Uh, I have served you with all of my heart, Lord. But the Israelites... They have disobeyed your commandments and torn down your altar, killed all of your prophets. I alone am left. Now they want to kill me too. Go out and stand before the Lord. Then a great strong wind came through the mountain. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. Then there was a sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he hid his face in his coat and went and stood at the entrance of the cave. What are you doing here, Elijah? Go back. There are 7,000 in Israel that have not bowed to Baal. So Elijah left that place. And as he traveled, he found a man named Elisha. He was out plowing a field with a yoke of 12 oxen. Elijah passed by him and threw his coat on him. And Elijah left, Elisha left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and my mother and I will follow you. Go back. What, what have I done? Elisha went back, prepared a meal and ate. But then he left home, followed Elijah, he knew he had been called to be God's next prophet. Now, time passed, and it was nearing the end of Elijah's work for the Lord. Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. As the Lord lives, and as you live, I will follow you. Along the way, a son of the prophets came out and said to Elisha, Yes, I know. Keep quiet. And as they traveled on, again Elijah said, Please, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. As the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. And another son of the prophets came out and said to Elisha, Do you not know that today the Lord will take away your master? Yes, I know. <laughs> Keep quiet. Then again Elijah said, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to the Jordan. As the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. And when they arrived at the Jordan, Elijah took off his coat. He rolled it up and struck the water with it. The water parted to one side and the other. Then they both walked over on dry ground. 
What can I do for you before I'm taken away? Give me a double portion of your spirit. You ask for a hard thing, but if you see me as I'm taken away, you will have what you ask for. As they went, chariots of fire came and separated the two men. And Elisha watched as Elijah was taken up into heaven by a whirlwind. My father, my father, the of Israel, and his then Elisha took up the coat of Elijah and went back to the Jordan. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Taking the coat of Elijah, Elisha struck the water, and again it parted. Elisha crossed over, and the sons of the prophet said, The spirit of Elijah is on Elisha. And they bowed down before him. And that's it. Oh, great, guys. That was a wonderful story of, of Elijah going to heaven, and Elisha now is God's prophet. Elisha will continue with God's work. Was it a good story? Yes. All right. All right, guys, let's get going.